All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and we're about to go over something really complicated and might even be a little bit unsatisfactory. I'm going to uh, just uh, try to show you what is going on with this situation, the uh, dep the repository, the depository, yes, the the book depository. No, the repository takedown on GitHub of the um, what is it? Uh, the YouTube dash DL um, project, I guess, is a term for it. Let me adjust my microphone just a smidge here so it's pointing at me. Maybe even a smidge more. All right, how is everybody? Nihilus, the one who is meme me, and Midnight Rose. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome, 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 welcome. Of course, I am wearing my copyright shirt and my pirate hat that I got at the costume store. So I think we're ready to go. There are already 82 of you here. Uh, so I'm just gonna take one second and chat at you for a moment. Hello, Nicholas. Hello, Brian from Seattle. Excellent. Why do you have Chrome Dev Tools up? <laughs> well, it has to do with one of the cool parts of this. Uh, not all the aspects of this are going to be very cool, but uh, but this this is kind of cool. Um, so first, if you try to load one of these repositories that has been taken down, well, I'm not sure if you're aware what an HTTP request is and what server response codes are, but if you take a look here, on my screen, which might be a little bit difficult to see with this blocking it, there we go, um, you can see that when you try to load the YouTube-DL project, you get a status code of 451, which is unavailable for uh, legal reasons. And so if you look down there in the bottom right there, it says unavailable for legal reasons. I don't know if I can zoom in on that at all, so I'm not even going to try. But uh, that's that's something kind of funny. That is a HTTP status code specifically created for legal notices and takedowns and things. And of course, it is taken after Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, which is a, a book about a dystopian future where firemen uh, go around burning books and all books are outlawed so you can't have any books. So uh, HTTP 451 is literally taking after Fahrenheit 451. It's a great book. Uh, I haven't entirely read it. I think I read it a long time ago or part of it or something or I might just have a copy sitting in my library someplace. But that's not why you're here. I'm just needlessly delaying so that we can get everybody in because I didn't give a whole lot of notice. Yes, Harrod, I am soft-spoken because Kaylee is in bed. Yes, that's uh, that's also why my my background is darkened and and um why I maybe a little am I am I too soft-spoken? I don't have my level meters up here. Let me uh let me do a mic check, mic check. Yeah, we're okay. We're hitting about negative five. I could maybe bring this up just a hair if you wanted to get a little bit better on that. Check. Can I get a mic check, mic check? Is that up to seven? That's yeah, it's up to seven. We should not go any farther than seven. Okay, so... <laughs> no, I'm not sick. It's just late here and um, and my wife is sleeping. So what we're talking about today is this DMCA. It's really cool that GitHub publishes their DMCA takedowns because not everybody has to do this. This says October 23rd, 2020, GitHub. This is the letter to GitHub from the RIAA. Dear sir or madam, I am contacting you on behalf of the Recording Industry Association of America. Boo, the Recording Industry, boo, uh, and its member record companies. The Recording Industry of America, RIAA, is a trade association whose member companies create, manufacture, or distribute sound recordings representing approximately 85% of all legitimate recorded music consumption in the United States. Under penalty of perjury, we submit that the RIAA is authorized to act on behalf of its member companies on matters involving the infringement of their sound recordings, audiovisual works, and images, including enforcing their copyrights and common law rights on the internet. I, I don't know about a common law right to copyright. 
Uh, okay, but we don't really care about that here. So there's two parts to this. And so first, copyright violations. We have learned that your service is hosting the YouTube-DL source code on its network at the following locations. And that's where we get this repository unavailable due to DMCA takedown. So this is literally the YouTube dot or YouTube dash DL uh, link. And then there's, I don't know, a dozen and a half others. And it says the above list includes a representative sample of the YouTube DL forks of the YouTube DL source code that is being hosted on GitHub. Based on our review of the representative sample noted above, we have a good faith belief that most of the YouTube DL forks are infringing to the same extent as the parent repository. What are they talking about with we have a good faith belief? Well, there is part of the DMCA here that if we go to section F here requires them to have a good faith belief. Um, a person who knowingly material, materially misrepresents under this section shall be liable for damages if, you know, and the knowing materially misrepresents is translated to a good faith belief. It's also part of the notice that they have to send here. Uh, if we go up to the uh, section C3, elements of a notification that uh, they have a good faith belief somewhere in here, it should be that they have uh, information is accurate under penalty of perjury, complaining party, oh, yeah, good faith belief. Here you go in section five. So or sub 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 section five. So back to our DMCA, it says the clear purpose of the source code is to circumvent the technological protection measures used to authorize used by authorized streaming services such as YouTube and reproduce and redistribute music videos and sound recordings owned by our member companies without authorization for such use. We note that the source code is described on GitHub as a command line program to download videos from YouTube.com and a few more sites. We also know that the source code prominently includes a sample um, use of the source code for downloading which the example is downloading of copies of our members copyrighted sound recordings. For example, as shown on exhibit A, the source code expressly suggests that it be used to copy or distribute the following copyrighted works owned by our member companies, uh, Icona Pop, Justin Timberlake, Taylor Swift. The source code notes that the Icona Pop work identified above is under the YouTube standard license, which expressly restricts access to copyrighted works only for streaming on YouTube and prohibits their further reproduction distribution without consent of the copyright owner. And that Justin Timberlake, uh, Justin Timberlake identified above, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Taylor Swift identified above, et cetera, are all under the YouTube um, standard license. We have a good faith belief that this activity is not authorized by the copyright owner. It's a agent or the law. Now, that's what we're going to go over today. And this is kind of a, a complicated thing. I've been carefully researching this. Um, and I have a whole list of, uh, of outline here to go over. So we've gotten to what I want to read about the DMCA. Let's go over to a case that I prepared. And it has a well, I didn't prepare the case, I just prepared the reading of the case. The DMCA was enacted in 1998 to implement the World Intellectual Property Organization Copyright Treaty, which requires contracting parties to provide adequate legal protection and effective legal remedies against the circumvention of effective technological measures that are used by authors in connection with the exercise of their rights under this treaty or the Berne Convention, and that restrict acts in respect to their works, which are not authorized by the authors concerned or permitted by the law. Even before the treaty, Treaty, Congress had been devoting attention to the problems faced by copyright enforcement in the digital age. Hearings on the topic spanned several years. The legislative effort resulted in the DMCA. That was back in 1996 through 98, I believe. So the, to, to sort of sum up the history, the internet was coming into popular consciousness only really right around the mid to late 90s. Yours truly was first on the internet in like 94. And I mean, you still had eWorld and then uh, AOL, and AOL was there too. And then I think, 
one of the, I think Apple's eWorld got absorbed by AOL. I think that was how that happened. Um, you know, there were still services like Gopher and Waze. Um, th- you still used FTP to get things uploaded and downloaded. Um, we don't really do that anymore. The world has changed. The internet has grown. It is literally 24, 25 years later, uh, 24, 22 since the DMCA was act- enacted. And the law has not really been updated much. We'll, we'll, we'll see that there's one update that, that we can sort of look at, but um, there's not a whole lot that's been updated. So let's go over what the law says. It's actually really, really, the law as written is kind of simple. It says here, this is 17 USC 1201, circumvention of copyright protection systems. No person shall circumvent a technological measure that effectively controls access to a work protected under this title. The prohibition contained in the preceding sentence shall take effect, well, it's already taken effect. The prohibition shall not apply to persons who are users of a copyrighted work if it is a particular class of works, if such person are or likely to be uh, in the succeeding three-year period adversely affected by virtue of such prohibition and their ability to make non-infringing uses of that particular class of works. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but it sounds like uh, some kind of accommodation for fair use. Um, And then during the two-year period, It doesn't matter right now, but then there is a succeeding three-year period that we'll get to. There are exceptions to this, and so we're going to go over the exceptions too. Um, So, well, why don't we just why don't we just talk at the camera for a moment? First, let me say thank you for Cameron Ogletree. Never seen a 451 in the wild. Yeah, it's 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 usually pretty hidden from you. You can you can use your your um, developer tools to figure that out. For example, here, if I'm on this page and I hit, uh, what is it, F12, where'd my cursor go? If I hit F12 and go over to network here and you have to reload the page, you'll see that you have an HTTP get request uh, status 200, which is the status that you want. It means you've gotten the document that you want. So, um, yeah. Uh, Midnight Rose, thank you for the $20. Leonard, thanks for you and your videos. Very prepared for the copyright portions of the NFPA Paralegal Advanced Competency Exam, which I passed. Excellent. Glad to hear. That's great. That's great. Um, really appreciate that you that you uh, passed. Um, I have a feeling you passed not because of my channel, but rather that you watch my channel because you are interested in copyright law. So you, you probably uh, were already doing quite well for yourself, but I, but I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so what has happened? YouTube DL is a program that allows you to, it says a command line, but it can also be used by server operators. You go to a website and you type in a YouTube or you paste a YouTube URL and then it provides the video file to you. Uh, you know, everything's got to get converted to a readable format at some point, right? So even when you're watching a YouTube video, there's something going on in the background in the code that decrypts or or pulls the video file from somewhere. Now, there's obviously this is more complicated than that. It feeds only a little bit of the video to you at a time, but somehow it's cached on your system. And if you had access to that, you could simply grab that code. You could simply grab that um, data, should I say, and convert it or store it into a complete file that you could then watch. This, when authorized, YouTube allows you to download videos using the YouTube app and everything. The, The really key point here to start with is that these things are different in technology than they are in legal. I have a technology degree. I studied information technology management after I didn't make it through electrical engineering school. And I have a master's degree in IT management. And I did spend some time working in IT. I have spent some time working on code. Um, For a long time there, I I worked on um, Visual Basic for applications in Excel, and then uh, C++ and C Sharp, making Excel spreadsheets smart and talk to a a backend system. And that um, experience 
led me to believe that really anything could be done with technology and who cares about copyright or who cares about the law? Look what the technology can do. Well, the, the law doesn't look at things so technologically. If this says no person shall circumvent a technological measure that effectively controls access to a work protected under this title, it's not really going to matter much to the court whether the effective access control is super strong, you know, triple encrypted, you know, AES 256 bit key, whatever. It's just going to matter to the court that the copyright owner tried something. There's, there are limits to this. Um, we can take a brief look at something called the Chamberlain case. Uh, Chamberlain or Chamberlain um, is a garage door opener company. And they, back in 2004, brought a DMCA or a copyright action against Skylink Technologies for making a garage door opener. Um, if you're not familiar with how garage door openers work, there's like a rolling code key, sort of like what you would use to access a bank account these days. You'd have like a rolling code token or some something that, that two-factor authentication, basically. Well, with garage door openers, it's not really two-factor, it's, it's a rolling code. Well, Skylink made some kind of technology that could open Chamberlain garage doors. Of course, they still had to be paired or, or somehow connected, but Chamberlain tried to say that this was a circumvention of a technological protection measure, and the court said no. Chamberlain sued Skylake in the Northern District of Illinois uh, in two cases. The contention was that Skylink's technology was designed to circumvent the technological protection measures put in place uh, to protect Chamberlain's codes. It had limited commercial use other than to circumvent the rolling code, and it was marketed to circumvent that technology, which is a requirement here or an av available claim under the law. Um, let's see here. No person shall manufacture, import, offer to the public, provide, or otherwise traffic in technology, product, service, device, component. So what the heck does technology mean? It could very well just mean the source code. So back to the Chamberlain Group case. Skylink claimed that consumers use the transmitter to activate the security plus garage door opener with Chamberlain's consent. The uh, code, uh, the, um, the law here, section 1201A3A, over here, A3, A3A, a circle, circum, circum, yeah, to circumvent a technological measure means to descramble a scrambled work, to decrypt an encrypted work, or to otherwise avoid, bypass, remove, deactivate, or impair a technological measure without the authority of the copyright owner. Which, it, which is what it says there. I just read it there over there instead. Uh, they also claimed that the transmitters served a variety of functions that were unrelated to circumvention, that Chamberlain had failed to demonstrate that the garage door openers contained a copyrighted computer program, and that Skylink had not violated the DMCA because its acts fell within a safe harbor provision in section F. Section F down here says that you're allowed to reverse engineer. A person who has lawfully obtained the right to use a copy of a computer program may circumvent the technological measure. Uh, a person may develop and employ technological means to circumvent measures in order to enable identification and analysis for paragraph one. And uh, the information may be made available to others and it may be made available for the purpose of enabling interoperability of systems, of computer systems and things. So that actually was enough. The district court agreed with Skylink that Chamberlain did not explicitly restrict the consumer's use of alternate transmitters. This was deemed an unconditional state, unconditional sale that implicitly authorized customers to use other transmitters. I don't know if the first sale doctrine was actually mentioned, but it would go something like this. You buy a garage door opener yourself, like the actual mechanism that literally lifts the door. And, and of course, it includes a system to, you know, with a clicker. And by owning your copy of that, you can make whatever you want to access that copy. So that was deemed not a violation of the technological protection measures. 
Let's take a look at another case, MDY versus Blizzard. This is with the Glider, uh, I think it was an automation system, a bot that allowed Glider to play WoW for its users. The district court for the District of Arizona uh, ruled in favor of Blizzard with respect to liability for contributory copyright infringement and vicarious copyright infringement and tortious interference of a contract. The court granted summary judgment on a different claim I'll just get to that in a second. In its ruling, Blizzard's contributory copyright infringement claims, the district court first considered whether purchasers of WoW were legal owners of the software. Uh, they were owners of the computer program, so they're allowed to modify the non-server served copy of the program, but they were not allowed to modify the, the server, the dynamic content that was served up by the server. So players are required to make use of the software within a license agreement. Blizzard specifically prohibited the use of bots or third-party software. Um, the client software of WoW is copied to the program's operation from a hard drive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The court found that since the prohibition on botting was a prohibition related to Blizzard's copyright, users of Glider infringed Blizzard's copyright when they played the game in violation of the license. The court believed that MDY, the providers of Glider, uh, to be encouraging and profiting from this copyright infringement and therefore found MDY secondarily liable for copyright infringement. They also ruled that Glider users had violated the DMCA by using Glider to circumvent Blizzard's Warden program, a security application that controls access to the World of Warcraft game environment. Um, the Ninth Circuit quoted Chamberlain versus Skylink and here's here's where the circuits or here's where the courts start to diverge. Chamberlain said that this 1201 anti-circumvention measure was a claim but not a right. So in other words, it's not another copyright. So you have like the right to prevent copies, the right to prevent derivative works, the right to control publication or performance. This is not a, a right to prevent the circumvention of your technology. But then the Ninth Circuit says, oh yes it is. And so we now we have two different courts, the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, which is a weird thing. It's a, it's a circuit court, it's appeals court for certain kinds of federal claims. I'm not even really sure how Chamberlain made it into the federal court system in that way instead of in Illinois, which would be the Fourth Circuit. I don't remember. Um, but either way, it's not the Ninth Circuit. So we have two different circuit courts, two different appeals courts with two different applications of this 1201 se uh, section, is this um, anti-circumvention section. So where we're going here, if you haven't figured this out yet, is there's only about four cases that really deal with 1201 anti-circumvention of technological protection measures that, that really went anywhere that um, give us any guidance. And then we have a similar case here with um, VidAngel, which is actually a case that we covered on this channel. VidAngel got hit with a $62.5 million judgment, I think, for uh, copyright infringement what they were doing was a cleaning up or, or removing the objectionable material from various different movies, and that included some Disney movies. Uh, and to do so, they were making copies and then circumventing the various technological protection measures, like CSS on DVD movies. Like CSS has been cracked for a long time. That doesn't mean it's legal to continue to crack CSS. It just means that technologically it's super easy to do. It doesn't actually mean that it's legal. Same thing here with YouTube DL. Just because it's super easy to crack or, or bypass YouTube's basic DRM doesn't mean that it's legal to do so. There are some questions and some caveats here. Isn't YouTube DL just source code by itself? Doesn't it actually not do anything? You can't, you can't go to GitHub and run YouTube DL from GitHub. So is GitHub or, or is the creator of YouTube DL actually promoting the circumvention of technological protection measures? I don't know. That's, that's for a court to decide and we haven't had court cases on that yet. Um, what is the status of a 1201 right? Uh, can you just, uh, you know, can you 
is it just a claim or is it also a right? Does it override fair use? We don't know. Um, so but let's finish with VidAngel here. Uh, VidAngel, uh, let's see, uh, was ordered to stop streaming movies. The Family Movie Act requires the filtered content to come from an authorized copy of the film. So because it didn't come from an authorized copy of the film, they were streaming an unauthorized copy and circumventing uh, copy protection. So those are the basic examples that we've got for you. Let me see if there's some questions here on Y Combinator. Uh, let, me, let me zoom in because this is just small. Uh, note that the RIAA is making this takedown because the software can be used to download copyrighted music and videos. It uses the examples in the README. Uh, it feels like DECSS -E all over again, which uh, there were back in the day, once CSS was cracked, the DCSS program got taken down. And that just meant that everybody who had a copy of it uploaded it. I'm not encouraging that at all, but but that's what happened. Similarly, when Blu-ray, when the, the key for Blu-ray decryption was found and it tried and, and, and the, the movie industry tried to suppress it, then it was just posted everywhere. I think you can even buy t-shirts with the code on it is, is how prolific that became. Um, let's take a look at another post here. Worth noting that the MPA already tried this with Popcorn Time. The Popcorn Time devs put in a counter notice and the repository was back a few weeks later. Yes, so that's what I expect to happen. I expect that either GitHub or the user who was in charge of these, any, any one of these repositories, whoever it is, you know, each, each one's probably a different user. Um, they could put in a DMCA counter notice. I'm not recommending it. I don't, you know, that's not for me to recommend. That's, that's legal advice and I'm not, uh, I'm not giving legal advice here. If someone either talks to their attorney or otherwise believes that they have a valid defense and that the YouTube DL repository is somehow not involved with circumventing technological protection measures or some other you know, legitimate understanding of the law or legitimate defense, or they just want to take their case to court and present those defenses, uh, then they can issue a counter notice. They have the right to issue a counter notice, but they don't necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily a good idea. Um, we'll just cover a few more things here. Um, assuming YouTube DL is dead and the API has become hopelessly ob obfuscated, how hard would it be to talk to YouTube as if I were a Samsung smart TV? It's probably not technologically hard to bypass these uh, protection measures. The courts have not said that these protection measures had to be particularly strong. They, it, it, there isn't something written into the law that says only technological protection measures that, that, um, that use AES 256-bit encryption or something. It's, it's not like that's how that works. Uh, let's see. Mind if I share a link in the C-sharp Discord? Go ahead. Um, it, it has nothing to do with the strength of the encryption. Uh, real player next. Download web videos. Keep your favorite web videos safe on your PC by downloading. Well, there is, um, that, that's this, uh, there is a limit here. And the limit's going to be whether the software was primarily intended for committing copyright infringement. So this does not extend to web browsers. This does not mean that because your web browser could be used to then screen capture YouTube videos or something that that means that web browsers have to be uh, taken down as they are circumventing technological protection measures. Um, that's sort of the line here is whether or not the protection or whether or not the software was created primarily for circumventing technological protection measures. Remember it says here, no person, let me zoom in here a little bit. No person, and I'll take my face off. Uh, no person shall circumvent a technological protection measure. No person shall manufacture, import, offer to public a technology that is primarily designed and produced for the purpose of circumventing a technological measure that effectively controls access to a work protected under this title, has only limited commercial purpose other than for circumventing the technological protection measures, or 
So in the disjunctive is marketed by that person or another person acting in concert with that person with the person's knowledge for use in circumventing a technological measure. So marketed, so it's either designed, uh, has no commercially significant purpose other than or is marketed for the purpose of bypassing a technological protection measure. So let's take a look back here then, finally, at the anti-circumvention violation. We, the RIAA, also note that the provision or trafficking of the source code violates section 1201A2 or B1, which is what we just read. The source code is a technology primarily designed or produced for the purpose of and marketed for circumventing a technological measure that effectively controls access to a copyrighted work uh, sound recordings in this case on YouTube, including copyrighted sound recordings owned by our members. I'm gonna put my face back up. For further context, please see the attached court decision from now. This is this is where it gets a little ridiculous, and here's where like you can see that the four cases that that uh, that I found in the uh, in the U.S. sort of fall away. Please see the attached court decision from the Hamburg Regional Court which is not Hamburg, Pennsylvania, but Hamburg, Hamburg, Germany, that describes the technological measure at issue, YouTube's rolling cipher, and the court's determination that the technology employed by YouTube is an effective technological protection measure within the meaning of EU and German law, which is materially identical to Title 17, uh, yeah, Section 1201 of the US Code. Okay, I know that sounds absolutely ridiculous, and believe you me, I am not defending the RIAA, but remember, let's go back to this Chamberlain case. The DMCA was enacted to implement a World Intellectual Property Organization Treaty, a international treaty. So if the EU has implemented a similar law, well, maybe that's persuasive to a U.S. court when the U.S. court is going to have to decide whether YouTube's digital rights management, whatever that means, what, whatever technology they've employed to control access to downloading YouTube videos, whether or not that's an effective measure within the meaning of U.S. law, well, they're gonna, the U.S. court is going to get to read what the EU and German court said. And I do realize how ridiculous that sounds, that EU or German law would be applied to the U.S., but that's not quite what's happening here. What's happening is the, the RIAA is trying to make a persuasive argument here uh, in the DMCA as to why this source code repository has to be taken down. Now, you may disagree. Uh, I sort of disagree, but I'm trying to explain how the law will look at it, not how Leonard French feels about it or not how you feel about it. Uh, thank you to Ian Flynn for your five dollars. Uh, source code is free speech and should be protected under the First Amendment. Um, we're we're gonna get to that in a second. Hypothetically, could I get in trouble for downloading my own Animal Crossing videos off of Twitter with the YouTube DL tool? Um, hmm, that's a fun one. Could you get in trouble for downloading your own videos? Probably not, because you're the copyrighted owner. What's different here is the RIAA is claiming ownership of the of the music videos that, that they're licensees have on YouTube that are then, I mean, let's be fair here. I, I, I'm a, I'm a piracy defense attorney and I see lots of people who in fact have committed piracy. So yeah, I, there are people who are downloading movies and music videos and music off of YouTube using these tools, whether the whether this meets the Section 1201 definition is up for debate, but remember, that includes marketing. So if literally the source code repository says you can use this to download music videos off of YouTube and specifically refers to Sony, BMG, or, or RIAA represented music, well then that's under Section 2C here that they 
they they marketed a technological protection measure circumventing program. Um, I mean, it's 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 not the greatest argument. Not, not there isn't really a great defense argument to it that I can see. Um, where was I going with this? Back to the DMCA here. That's right. So, as is in the let's see, what do they say? The court further determined that the service at issue in the German law Hamburg case unlawfully circumvented YouTube's rolling code cipher technological measures. The YouTube DL source code functions in a manner essentially identical to the service at issue in the Hamburg Regional Court decision. As there, the YouTube DL source code available on GitHub, which is the subject of this notice, circumvents YouTube's rolling cipher to gain unauthorized access to copyrighted audio files in violation of YouTube's express terms of service and in plain violation of section 1201 of the DMCA. Indeed, the comments in the YouTube DL source code make clear that the source code was designed and is marketed for the purpose of circumventing YouTube's technological measures to enable unauthorized access to our members' copyrighted works and to make unauthorized copies and distributions thereof. They identify our members' works. They note that the works are Vivo videos, virtually all of which are owned by our member companies. They acknowledge that those works are licensed to YouTube under the YouTube standard license, so that means copyright applies and it is it is licensed and, and so YouTube's terms of service apply, like the Blizzard case and they use those examples in the source code to describe how to obtain unauthorized access to copies of our members' works. So it's marketed. Is, is it, they, they don't need to make a better argument to win. They need to make a basic case, and that's a basic case whether I like it or not. I mean, you know, sort of whether you like it or not, because let's be fair here, it's already worked. The repositories are down, hence I started with the 451 error code or status code from the HTTP GET request. In light of the above noted copyright infringements and anti-circumvention violations, we ask that you immediately take down and disable access to the YouTube DL source code at all of its locations where it is hosted on GitHub, including without limitation those locations in the list set forth above. Now that's disingenuous because the DMCA only allows them to take down what they can actually list. So if they listed 18 repositories and there were actually 100, well, only 18 need to be taken down and only the ones that they list. Uh, this email does not constitute a waiver of any right to cover damages. It, it never did. They always had the right to pursue copyright infringement even if they send a DMCA. And all other rights, as well as claims for other relief, are expressly reserved. You may contact me at private telephone number and private email. Sincerely, private person. Um, and the, I'm sure that the private part, the part that's redacted out there, has been removed by GitHub. Not that it arrived like that from the RIAA. So there is something. There is supposed to be some kind of fair use exception or some kind of free speech accommodation in copyright law. Normally, we consider fair use to be the accommodation of free speech into copyright law. So what I have for you here is something from the Federal Register. The Federal Register is where the federal government posts their rulemaking now, rulemaking is an administrative law term. Um, ad admin law is referring to admin agencies, which would be part of the executive branch. Uh, this, is a, this is a controversial topic of, of not law, but of federalism and the construction of our government. Congress can delegate powers to be executed by the executive branch. The executive branch has so many things to do that it can't do every, you know, one, one White House cannot do everything. So Congress has created administrative agencies with authorities to uh, make rules that act like laws and regulations and they have to follow a what we call a notice and comment procedure. If you remember the um, net neutrality hearings with Ajit Pai and how everybody was upset that there were so many comments in favor of net neutrality but Ajit Pai uh, and, and, and the uh, agency, the uh, FT, FCC, excuse me, the FCC ruled against net neutrality, then, you know, that's what we're talking about here. There's supposed to be a notice and comment 
rulemaking procedure. Uh, this is that procedure here at the Library of Congress. This is the final rule, and this is from, uh, I guess, 2017. Uh, October 26, 2018. So I guess it's I guess the rulemaking started in 2017, and then the final rule came out October uh, 26, 2018. And it's long, and it will take a long time to go over. So I highlighted out. I started to highlight out all of the proposed rules, and then I figured, why don't we just go over only the final rules? Because um, they did. They considered a whole bunch of different things. But what they're looking for are, way, are reasons to circumvent technological protection measures because some circumvention of technological protection measures should be perfectly legal and we can't count on Congress to be constantly updating copyright law. So Congress put in a section, uh, let me see if I can find it real quick here in the uh, DMCA. Congress put a section in here about the Library of Congress. Each succeeding three-year period, the Librarian of Congress, upon recommendation from the Register of Copyrights, who shall consult with other people and report and comment on his or her views, shall make the determination in a rulemaking proceeding for purposes of Subparagraphy, whether persons who are users of copyrighted works are likely to be adversely affected by the prohibition under paragraph A that they can't circumvent technological protection measures in their ability to make non-infringing uses under this title, so fair uses and other non-infringing uses. In concluding such rulemaking, the librarian shall examine the availability for use of copyrighted works, the availability of use for works for non-private, non-profit, excuse me, archival, preservation and educational purposes, the impact of that prohibition on circumvention of technological te uh, measures applied to copyrighted works has on criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research, so fair uses, and the effect of circumvention of technological protection measures on the market or value of the works and such other factors. So back here, here's what they said in the 2018 rulemaking that still applies today. Motion pictures, as defined in the law, where the motion picture is lawfully made and acquired on a DVD protected by CSS or Blu-ray by AACS or via a digital transmission protected by a technological measure and the person engaging in circumvention of this section reasonably believes that non-circumventing alternatives are unable to produce the required level of high quality content for the purpose of criticism or comment, for documentary filmmaking, for non-commercial videos, for non-fiction multimedia ebooks, for educational purposes, by college and university faculty, uh, students uh, kindergarten through 12th grade, uh, general education programs, purpose of criticism, comment, teaching, or scholarship. If you're doing these things, you're going to want to read this in detail and see whether you actually fall under the law because it's very specific. Not just everybody can do this. It's only certain institutions. By faculty of massive open online courses offered by accredited nonprofit educational institutions to officially enrolled students. So it, there's, it's very specific. Um, by educators in nonprofit digital and media literacy programs offered by libraries, museums, and nonprofit entities with an educational mission. Uh, motion pictures. This is, this is another major section. Motion pictures, again, as defined in DVD, content scrambling system, Blu-ray, AACS system, and digital transmission, etc. cetera. Uh, circumvention undertaken by a disability service office or other unit of a kindergarten through 12th grade educational institution engaged in, etc., for the purpose of making an accessible version for someone with a disability. So in other words, when you follow these exceptions, you are not guilty of circumventing a technological protection measure. If YouTube DL was made and marketed for that, it would be much harder for the RIAA to take down. But the marketing material, which I realize is just like the README, but that's still, like, that's still marketing material. 
uh, that is what they're citing to. That is what the RIAA is citing to. And if I was your defense attorney defending you from a 1201 violation for YouTube DL, uh, I would be like, okay, they said that you said this. Did you say this? And if the readme really did say that, I'm like, okay, they're going to use that against you in court. And we have to somehow find a way to counter that. The educational institution, um, let's see, has determined after reasonable effort that the accessible version cannot be obtained in a timely manner, etc. So they, there can't be an accessible version already out there. In other words, you can't just go bypass technological protection measures because you want to. It has to be because that's the only way to do it. Um, let's see, three, because we're going with major headings here, three literary works distributed electronically for blind users or other person with a disability. Uh, moving faster, literary works for um, medical devices. So if you have a medical device that's generating like a log of your medical information, you can probably circumvent that. Uh, by a patient for the sole purpose of lawfully accessing his or her data generated by his or her own device. So five, computer programs that enable the following types of lawfully acquired wireless devices. Here's, here's the jailbreaking provision. You can break your iPhone's DRM so that you can put you know, you can sideload your own apps or something, basically. Wireless telephone app, uh, wireless telephone handsets, all-purpose tablet computers, portable mobile connectivity devices, mobile hotspots, etc. cetera. Uh, wireless devices, and this is for the purpose of solely connecting the wireless to a wireless telecommunications network. Um, there's another one here for computer programs that enable smart televisions, computer programs that enable voice assistant devices to access uh, lawfully obtained software, computer programs that are contained in or control the functioning of lawfully acquired motorized land vehicles, personal automobiles, consumer or excuse me, commercial vehicles, or mechanized agricultural vehicles. This is the John Deere exception. John Deere puts DRM into their tractors, uh, not necessarily your uh, you know your little ride-on mower for your lawn we're talking about big pieces of farm equipment like combines um, they put DRM in there so that only John Deere can supply services to your tractor it's pretty terrible and you can read article after article after article about it on the internet on one hand if you are a major commercial farm sure you're just gonna pay John Deere to fix your tractor but if you're um, you know, a, an independent farmer and you want to fix your own tractor, well, this allows you to do some things to fix your own tractor. So this is when circumvention is necessary to allow the diagnosis, repair, or lawful modification of a vehicle function. It actually does not say that you're allowed to copy John Deere's diagnos diagnostic software. It says that you're allowed to bypass their DRM to do your own diagnosis. So it's a, you know, it's not a complete vindication there. Um, let's see, computer programs for home thermostats, refrigerators, thermostats, HVAC, in order to diagnose, maintain, repair. Um, I missed one here. Computer programs, circumvention is lawfully undertaken for research, for security research, for good faith security research, and does not violate any other applicable law. Video games in the form of computer programs embodied in physical or download formats that have been lawfully acquired because the server has ceased working and you need to bypass some authorization so that you can play the game that the server no longer serves up. You can do that. And there's, again, details to that, so don't just go do it without reading. Uh, that was 12, 13 over here, computer programs that no longer reasonably available um, solely for the purpose of lawful preservation or digital materials depending upon a program for condition of access by an eligible library, archive, or museum where such activities are carried out without any purpose of direct or indirect commercial advantage and the program is not distributed. 14, computer programs that operate 3D printers that employ microchip reliant technological measures to limit the use of feedstock. So you can't be locked into your you know, your PLA spool coming from a certain company. You can use whatever feed stock you want. And that's it. They don't have a whole lot more in there. There's not something in there for you to download your YouTube videos. 
Um, and I'm not just being tongue in cheek. There's, there's really nothing in there that allows you to download YouTube videos by circumventing YouTube's DRM. YouTube provides a way for you to download your videos in the app. And if that's not enough, well, too bad. Um, I'm just being the messenger here. Don't shoot the messenger. Let's see here. There's a lot of you, 853, excellent. So that is basically what I have for you. Let me see if there's anything else here. We went over Digit VidAngel, we went over Y Combinator, um, and we went over the DMCA. So yeah, I know that that's not the most fulfilling answer. I, I know that, that it would be really nice if the answer was, yes, you, you can put YouTube DL back up and you can, you can continue to use it for, for YouTube downloading, but, but no, on first glance and with some basic research, it looks like it's still up for grabs in the court system. So the options are that the owners of those repositories could issue a DMCA counter notice, which is under that same uh, section 512, it's 17 USC 512G is the counter notice section. And they just have to say that they have a good faith belief that the material was removed by mistake or, or a misrepresentation or misunderstanding or something. Uh, and then it's supposed to go to a court, uh, but Remember that these host services like GitHub, but more so YouTube and, and other, uh, sir, other, other user-generated content hosts, don't really have an obligation to host your content. So many of them say they don't have to obey a counter notice because they never had the obligation to put your content up in the first place. So I'm not sure what GitHub's position is going to be, but um, it's possible that that GitHub will honor a counter notice, but it's also possible that GitHub won't honor a counter notice. So if somebody issues a counter notice, GitHub could put the repository back up, and then it's supposed to become a court case between the RIAA and the owner of that repository, and that's how GitHub stays in their safe harbor. That's what this DMCA thing is all about for the host. If they obey the DMCA takedown notice, then GitHub, the host, is not responsible, vicariously liable, which is the term in the law, vicariously liable means like, is your boss liable for when the employee does something illegal? Um, contributory liable is another way that a third party could be liable for something a first party did. GitHub doesn't want to be responsible for your copyright infringement. So if YouTube DL is copyright infringement, either direct infringement of a section 106 right or infringement of a section 1201 claim or right, depending upon this circuit split, then, uh, then GitHub doesn't want to be liable for that. So the user might be liable for that, but GitHub won't be if they obey the takedown notice. And then if they choose to obey the counter notice, then then um, GitHub can't be held liable under under copyright infringement or, or really any other, uh, well, I don't know about any other liability, but um, but definitely not under copyright. So that's what they're doing. Uh, GitHub is obeying the law. The, D, the RIAA is making the case that YouTube DL was not just circumventing technological protection measures, but that it was marketed as such. And both of those things count. And there is some gray area out there about whether whether the source code, uh, here's, here's another part to it. The section 1201 says that it has to circumvent a technological protection measure of the owner. And we looked at a case, the Blizzard case, where Glider was circumventing Warden by Blizzard. It was circumventing the technological protection measure by Blizzard to access the game by Blizzard. But that's not what we have here, is it? We have a circumvention of, of a protection measure by, uh, by YouTube DL against YouTube's measure to get at some other owner's content. 
I think that's still going to be enough. But there is a difference there. So that case maybe hasn't exactly been the same thing. VidAngel bypassed technological protection measures on Disney's DVDs to get at Disney's content. Not the same thing. So YouTube DL bypassed YouTube's DRM to get at other people's content. So does that, is that really something that a court is going to look at and say, oh yeah, yeah, this, this section 1201 saying that, um, it, that, it, that it controls access to a work protected under this title, uh, is it really proper to bring a, a suit like that when the owner and the host are two different companies? I, I think it will be. I, th I think that the courts will read the broad word wording of the language in section 1201 in favor of the RIAA. I, I, I'm really not defending the RIAA here. I think this is just my legal analysis. Please, please don't crucify me. Uh, please don't make me walk the plank. So <sighs> that's where we're at today. Um, Robert Mail just joined can someone at me with a summary so far here or at discord how about i try to give you a summary so here's where we're at um how far are we into this i don't know where's my where's my clock telling me how far we're into this, this stream i don't know either way thank you thank you robert for the five dollars here's the summary the riaa issued a takedown notice here, I'll see if I can, I can give some examples here. The RIAA issued a takedown notice for several GitHub repositories that hosted the YouTube-DL source code. YouTube-DL source code can be compiled or otherwise used to access and download YouTube videos outside of YouTube's license. So you can download the video in an unprotected format, and then you can watch the video or listen to the audio of, say, a music video Let's say you want to listen to Katy Perry's Dark Horse. Well, you could download it with that. Um, there are other ways, of course. You could you could use screen capture technology to do that too. It's a little more work. This was more automatic. You just po pasted your link into it. Um, there were various, and probably still are, various websites that use this code. And then whoever pastes a YouTube link into the the right box and you know, the the server does its magic in the background and puts it through this kind of program, specifically this program or something like it, then you would get a, a download of that video outside of YouTube's license, not locked to the YouTube app and outside the license, arguably copyright infringement. Well, there is a section of the law, section 1201 of the DMCA, says that you can't circumvent technological protection systems. It says you can't circumvent the systems, nor does it, and it also says you can't create and distribute and market and profit from a system that circumvents copyright protection systems. So basically DRM. So the uh, YouTube-DL source code or program does pretty much exactly that. It but it circumvents the very basic protection that YouTube has against you downloading those videos. It was marketed for the downloading according to the RIAA because I don't have access to the YouTube DL source code. But they say that the README file said that, that it was meant to help you download a music video or three from the RIAA's licensees catalog. Um, so if it is created for the purpose of circumventing a, a technological protection measure, if it's distributed, if it's marketed, uh, any of those things can be cause for a violation of Section 1201 of the DMCA. So they sent a DMCA, they, the RIAA, sent this takedown notice. And so these GitHub repositories are now down and offline. And we briefly went over a couple different cases, one involving garage door openers, that garage door openers and, and making a garage door opener that can 
open somebody that can work with somebody else's garage door, uh, that's not a violation. We're not talking about a hacker opening anybody's garage door. We're talking about a company making a garage door opener that can pair with another maker's system. So you know, you you buy a generic garage door clicker and you can pair it with your system. Doesn't mean that you can just go around opening all of your your neighbor's garage doors. I, that's not the test case that we saw, so I can't tell you if that's circumventing a technological protection measure. But that, the garage door opener case, wasn't circumventing a technological protection measure. But botting in World of Warcraft, the glider software, was a, a circumventing a technological protection measure when it bypassed the Blizzard Warden technological protection measure, DRM, and then broke the, the license. Because the content was dynamically served, it didn't fall under any exceptions for you as the owner of your copy. Instead, it was the live content that was served by Blizzard. So that was circumventing a technological protection measure. Then we went over the VidAngel case, where VidAngel was uh, cleaning up or removing a f allegedly offensive content. This is subjective, of course, but you know, subjective, con subjectively uh, objectionable content. So making family-friendly videos out of uh, non-family-friendly friendly movies and TV shows. But they were both copying the movie, and to copy the movie and then remove the objectionable content, they were bypassing the technological protection measures, the DRM. Even though those measures are super crackable and easy to crack, DECSS is widely available. The key to, to get to bypass AACS on Blu-rays is widely available. There is no technological limit to the law. The law doesn't say that it has to be uncrackable technology. The law just says it has to be basically effective. And that, that, that definition of effective is not going to be uncrackable technology. It's going to be if a measure was implemented. So if they put up a basic metaphorical door to the content and you bypassed the door instead of operating within the license, then you were violating a technological protection measure and you could be liable under 1201. And because the DMCA is the safe has the safe harbor for hosts, the GitHub repository has to be taken down so that GitHub is not liable for the copyright infringement. And this is the music industry, the same, uh, maybe not the same music, well, it is the same music industry that recently issued a bunch of takedowns to Twitch. And so Twitch had to take down a whole bunch of people's content because the RIAA or, or somebody from the music industry was not happy with uh, Twitch's existing content match system or content ID system, which is, I'm corrected now, it's called Audible Match and it's not affiliated with Amazon. It's using the Audible name, but that's not not, not associated with audible.com or, or Audible, the audiobook company. Completely different companies, both using the name Audible. So Audible Magic is the content ID version that they use to match music now. And so Twitch is going to be implementing something like that, a content ID type system on Twitch because of the RIAA's aggression. Well, GitHub has to face the RIAA's aggression as well. So they're not really going to have a whole lot to fight with. I mean, the RIAA has virtually unlimited resources to fight these things. And does GitHub really want to get in the middle? No. So if they obey the DMCA takedown process, then they are in their safe harbor. And then everybody can file counter notices if they really feel like they have to do that. I would consult with an attorney or read up on, on your rights and try to figure out whether you've really got a, a right to use YouTube DL in the way that it's being used and marketed and all that, because I think this is dangerously close close to, if not well over the line into copyright infringement. So if you issue a takedown, actually if they obey the takedown, and if somebody issues a counter notice, GitHub can safely put the repository back up. They don't have to, but they can put the repository back up and then they will be in their safe harbor. The repository hosts, the owners, the users who created these repositories that are all listed here, some of these names, uh, 
Juan Huang Cyan and J.C. Kelly and Louis Plisso and Success Lee and R. Brito. Uh, those people are the repository users or owners, and those people could be liable if they put the repository back up. They still could be liable even when a DMCA counter note or even when a DMCA notice comes through, like we saw, that's not a waiver of copyright claims. So you could see future copyright litigation about this. I think the RIA will probably stop with just taking it down, but someone could issue a counter notice and then the matter has to go to court if the RIAA wants to pursue it. So that's what I have for you today. That's the summary. I hope you uh, I hope you understand a little bit better now. It was not my goal to make a feel good video about how uh, we all love YouTube DL and it should be back up and oh woe is us. It was my goal to explain how this works and why it's happening, and you can then decide for yourself whether to be happy or unhappy about it, or whether to roast the RIAA, or whether to complain about it on Twitter, or do whatever you're going to do. I just wanted to shed light on what's really going on. So that's what I have for you today. Let me see if I can take some questions here, and then I'll prepare to do my outro. Uh, reconstituted Patriot Act has nothing to do with this. I have no idea why that's in there. Um, get those VPNs spinning up people. Again, the VPNs don't have a whole lot to do with this. Uh, a VPN would not really have changed what's happening here. Um, I mean, let's be fair, this is the lightest kind of DRM. If you simply play a YouTube video back in your browser and use screen capture technology, then you can do the same thing. It's just not as easy as YouTube DL, which did it for you and did it asynchronously. So you don't have to watch the video, you just have to run the command and then you get a file downloaded. And so if you had a whole list, you could have run them through YouTube DL and you could have gotten a whole list, a whole, whole bunch of files at one time. Um, wouldn't it have to be a cease and desist letter, not a DMCA takedown? Well, the Section 512 and Section 1201 and Section 1202 are DMCA, so you, you can issue a DMCA takedown for a copyright violation. And so what the RIAA has alleged here is both copyright violations, and then they go on and explain the copyright violations and, and the three um, uh, examples that were in the README, allegedly, um, I think, let's see if I can even bring it up here anymore. Yeah, so if I try to bring it up, I get this repository unavailable with a 451 status code. Um, and then they have a circumvention violation in here. So it's both, they're asserting both section 106 rights and section 1201 rights. And the circuit courts are split. The appeals courts are split as to whether the section 1201 claim is also a copyright right. If it is a copyright right, then you can issue a DMCA for it. If it's not a copyright right, then you can issue a DMCA for a section 106 violation and then a claim for a 1201 violation, but not a takedown for a 1201 violation because that's not in there. So that's why they can't do that, Dustin. And that's why, they, that's why they're doing it that way. Um, let's see here. I just use VLC player to find the real URLs to the YouTube files. I'm glad that works for you. I have, I have no, I've tried that. I can't seem to get the VLC download thing to work. I just use screen capture when I need to make a fair use. Um, those weren't in the readme. Those were internal test cases. Okay. Maybe they weren't in the readme. It, it, it does say here now, now again, this is, this is a factual question. This is, you know, what is the actual truth here? The R, I'm just going to put it this way. The RIAA says, we note that the source code includes as sample uses, the downloading of copies of our members, copyrighted sound recordings, including these three expressly. So they're saying that these three examples were in the readme file, and then they give a link to the readme file here that we can't access because that's private, that's been taken down. 
let's see here. Sorry if you covered this already, but under the logic of the complaint, thank you, thank you UW Chad for the five dollars. Under the logic of this complaint, wouldn't all screen recording software be infringing, including uh, iOS's? No, and here's why. Let's go into section 1201 again. Um, it says no person shall shirk, no person shall circumvent a technological protection measure. So when you play a YouTube video on your phone on YouTube, in the YouTube app or in the browser, that's authorized by YouTube. So that's not circumventing a technological protection measure. If you use your screen recorder, that's not circumventing a technical measure. Maybe it's breaking a license, maybe it's still copyright infringement, but it's not circumventing a technological measure. And then there's a section here that says no person shall make a technology primarily designed for the purpose of circumventing. So is your screen capture software in iOS primarily designed to circumvent so technological protection measures? No, it's just basic screen capture technology. The difference here was, at least according to the RIAA, the YouTube DL software was expressly produced and designed for circumventing YouTube's basic DRM, admittedly basic DRM. So that's 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 why screen capture technology isn't automatically uh, this. Now you could make a basic screen capture technology, and you could market it. You could market it as use this to circumvent technological protection measures, and then you might be in violation of Section 1201. And then we get back to is that a claim within a copyright lawsuit or is that a separate copyright lawsuit right all by itself so you, you violated the right to prevent copies as well as the right to not bypass uh, technological protection measures a, a, a weird distinction but um you know it's there let's see copyright takedown yes this sounds arbitrary. You can download YouTube videos with, uh, again, the distinction between what technologically is a capa technology is capable of a very large number of things that doesn't make them all legal. Um, let me give you a really stupid analogy. Any of us could walk down the street and we could mind our own business or we could start swinging our fists at people. Just because you can doesn't mean it's legal and the law will look at the facts and circumstances of the behavior of in this case the software and decide whether it was primarily designed or made for a significantly uh, a limited commercially significant purpose or marketed for circumventing technological protection measures. If it's true that YouTube DL's README really said, hey, this is for circumventing YouTube's license and, and getting copyrighted music off of YouTube, it's not going to look so great. It's not that it's so easy to do. Lots of things are very easy to do. My primary job right now in the law so I make these YouTube videos. Great, I love you all. Thank you for your support. Um, but then my day job, when I'm when I'm done making a video, or or when I'm sometimes overwhelmed and I can't make a video, um, is defending people who are accused of piracy using BitTorrent. Very easy to do. It doesn't it doesn't mean that that mitigates the the violation of the law in any way. Uh, Greg Howell, thank you for the five dollars. Microsoft's parent company is Microsoft. What are the chances Microsoft will pursue this in court to help establish precedent? Get you mean GitHub? GitHub's parent company is Microsoft. Um, if so, if GitHub has the resources to pursue it, they're they're going to be having the, the the legal teams involved with GitHub and and their parent company are going to be figuring out whether it's worth it to try and set legal precedent. I've seen this before, back when BitTorrent file sharing, like I just talked about, um, was starting to to gain traction. Verizon and Comcast, who who I would never speak good about Verizon and Comcast, but I'm about to speak good about Verizon and Comcast. They went to bat for you. They tried to stop the 
mass filing of BitTorrent copyright infringement lawsuits, and they failed. But they spent a pretty good amount of their money trying to defeat the subpoenas and John Doe lawsuits involved with that kind of piracy, so they they tried. Uh, GitHub could try that, sure. What GitHub should do is still obey the DMCA takedown process and then separately file what's called a declaratory judgment action, where they ask for a judge to declare that they had not committed any copyright infringement and or, and or their users hadn't committed any copyright infringement. If they want to be the test case, they can. I, I doubt that they will be because we want it to be um, and, and pardon the bringing in of a different case, but we want it to be a Rosa Parks case. We want it to be a clean case where in, in Rosa Parks case, she was unimpeachable. She was a great witness. She was a great test case. And so they literally set up that test case. She went and sat in the front of the bus. She got arrested. She took it to court and she won because it was a clean case. This does not look like a clean case to me. I, I'm perfectly willing to be wrong, but there are literally four federal cases that I found that made any sense in Section 1201 and, and technological protection measures that were really about technological protection measures and not about something else that just also had a TPM claim in there. So the test case here is not a clean case in my opinion, and I'm not sure you're going to see this be made the test case because it's it's not clean it's not a clean test case jason bainham thank you for the twenty dollars thank you for your analysis yes and thank you for your understanding and thank you for watching this is i'm not perfect and this is a gray area of law so i'm just trying to do my best to help you understand what's really going on because frankly there's so much misunderstanding on the internet today it's easy to it's easy to get misled, and so I'm hoping that that you can see from the primary sources that I'm listing here, and that I'm that I'm that I'm putting up on the screen and such, that what's really going on is really what's going on, and not just my editorializing of it. Let's see. I wouldn't want to touch this case if I was Microsoft. Yeah, I agree. If you have any videos you like, download them now. I, you know, it, the 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 YouTube DL source code may be down, but I doubt that that means nobody has it. Um, I am certainly not encouraging you to go and get it somewhere, but it's probably a DECSS situation or an AACS situation where the Streisand effect will have something to say about it. Uh, we wonder if we have. An excuse if net neutrality was still a law. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think net neutrality has anything to do with this case. Um, net neutrality would be that common carriers have to carry all traffic equally and can't dis can't discriminate between different kinds of traffic. So I, I don't. I don't see that as applying here. Let's we'll see. I have a message on Discord. Um, who is messaging me on Discord? Leonard, if a technology has the effect of a TPM but was not designed, intended, or marketed as a TPM, does it still fall under 1201's ambit? Um, yes. So under 1201 here, first, no person shall circumvent technological protection measures. That's section A here. Uh, section A1, excuse me. And then section A2 is no person shall manufacture or offer to the public any technology. So if it does circumvent technological protection measures that effectively control access to a work under this title, some person is liable for that. Now, GitHub did not do that. GitHub is not, from what I see, my opinion, is not the person circumventing the technological protection measure. But GitHub would be offering to the public or otherwise trafficking in a technology now here's where you're primarily designed, et cetera, et cetera, comes into it. So the problem I see here, the one that's really clear to me uh, is that if the readme did actually say, you can use this to get RIAA works in so many words, that falls under 2C here pretty clearly. 
All right, before this becomes a several hour long live stream, how, how long have we been going here? We are at an hour and 18 minutes, so how about we don't do that? Um, thank you for watching. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. This is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education program here on YouTube, also on Floatplane and on Twitch. We are a community-supported organization. We have patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsus.com slash law and Floatplane and YouTube memberships if you want to support us so that we can make more videos for you. Um, Thank you very much. This is a, we, we are monthly supported, so it's not a per video charge. It's a monthly charge, and your benefit is mostly getting a shout out at the end of the videos, and then occasionally I make some uh, private content. We always do have a at least half an hour stream on Sunday mornings at 9:30 a.m. Eastern Time on uh, on YouTube for our members, for our Patreon supporters, and for our sponsor supporters. Um, Floatplane will be in there at some point when, if we can figure out how to stream to, to everybody at the same time. Right now I'm on kind of a limited SDSL connection. Thank you to our $50 plus supporters in the month of October. Joe Tyson, Wes Delge, Citizen of the Sovereign, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Andy, Benjamin Hightoff, Stephen, Goliath Cleric, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Rudolph Fesherer Jr., Jay Dixon, Hot Grills in Your Area, Oscar the Prophet, Brandon Abel, Torpedon, uh, let's see, what it, what it, what was I supposed to change I-A-N-A-L's, I-A-N-A-L's name to? It means I'm not a lawyer, but that's, but I am a lawyer, and so it's supposed to be a joke, but I, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> the, it's not, I don't like to say I am not a lawyer, that's weird, somebody's gonna take a sound bite of that. Uh, Cassandra Curran and Shadow Tycho. And you're scrolling on the LED panel back here, which is actually just a tablet simulating an LED panel, and you'll be in the, you are in the description of this video. So, Yes, normalized audio. There are hot grills in your area. Tank heavens for little grills. All right. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a great Sunday, a great Saturday night. I will see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. on twitch.tv slash lawful masses Eastern time, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Um, which is actually a weird. I'm going to lose an hour because I'm in Europe right now. So anyway, have a good one. Bye.